your refuge? Be your strong tower? I said something to the worship team on Wednesday night when we were rehearsing it. I said, sometimes I will go off in a, and just praise because that's what I do. If you feel that you just want to go off and praise and you sing a song to the Lord, go ahead and do that. Go ahead and do that. Do you know what I mean? When the music stops, you don't have to stop praising Him. We've been told many times that the scriptures don't they didn't have chapters and verses and we just go and flow and praise with Him, okay? Is that all right? So blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's sing that with one voice. All praise to Him who reigns above in majesty supreme. before we came. That affects you and I directly. I'm going to deal with that probably next Sunday uh, when I get a chance to speak. I'm going to deal with the rapture, resurrection, and judgment seat of Christ. I, I have messaged in all three of these topics and I'm going to try to the best of my ability to put all three of these into one. No, you don't need to bring your lunch. 
I won't keep you that long. I'll, I'll compress it. Uh, I'm going to do a, a message on the rapture, resurrection, and the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to do one message on the tribulation, the tribulation period. I, in that message, I'm going to talk about the Antichrist and the work and the role and the reception of the Antichrist as it relates to uh, the, the, the tribulation period. I'm going to do one series, one message on the second coming, the battle of Armageddon. The second coming and battle of Armageddon. And I will conclude my series, where I suppose sometime in August, if the Lord allows me, on the subject Jerusalem, old and new. Jerusalem, old and new. We're going to conclude by looking at our new home that has gone to prepare for us. It will be a wonderful exercise. Take your, take your Bibles and turn with me to the second book of Peter. The subject of the coming of Christ is probably uh, not a strange subject to you. You come from a rich heritage. Most of you of, 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 of Christianity and Pentecostalism that has kept the truth of the coming of the Lord, Jesus Christ, alive. I say that because there are many, many areas of the Christianity that no longer believes in the coming of the Lord. In fact, there is one area of Christianity that says the earth, the earth is going to get better and better, and then we're going to present a good earth to Jesus at some point, called Dominion Theology. I'm not sure what they were drinking or what they had eaten the night before they came over that one. But it certainly wasn't very awesome. Then you have other, you have another strain of, of, of Pentecostalism, and, and I talk about my own denomination because that's who I am. There's a strain of, there's another strain of Pentecostalism that says, look, we don't know when Jesus is coming, and so we don't talk about it. Because it confuses people. We, we just talk about other things. Of course, that is a terrible approach to things because the blessed hope is what keeps us looking. See, once a person loses hope, they lose the reason to live, don't they? Once the church loses the blessed hope for their soul. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a very deceptive thing. So I'm going to address this, this, this question this morning. Is Jesus coming? Is Jesus coming again? I would ask that question before the greater part of Christianity today, and they would say, you can't be kidding. You must be kidding. You can't be serious. You expect us to believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back, that the Bible is literal in when it says Jesus is coming back. You would be surprised at how many would ask that question. So I, I felt it important to examine this question, is Jesus coming again? And Peter saw this day in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Just want to read four verses. The first four verses of this, of this uh, chapter. 2 Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, referring, of course, Peter was, was writing, in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers. And the truth about it is here, uh, I read it for a long time, and I, I thought that this would be the, the, the uninitiated, the unsaved, the, the, those who knew nothing about the gospel. They would laugh at this idea of, of, of Jesus Christ coming back. Well, folks, that's not so. This scripture here is referring to religious people. This is for, referring to those who claim to know Christianity, who claim to have a spiritual experience, and and and... They know so much about it, you can tell by the fourth verse. They are walking after their own desires. And they're saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter said that toward the end times, there would be those who would reject 
the teaching and the preaching and the truth of the coming of Jesus Christ. And they would be amongst us. They would be part of what we call the church world. You see, the unchurched in mainly and the uninitiated, they, they, they don't care about Christ. They don't care about uh, the future. They don't care. They care about the here and now. So they're not really challenging the coming of Christ. They basically look at you and I as, as, as a fringe element of fundamentalism that, that, that has this weird idea that one day they're going to disappear. And so, what's the big deal? This is not the world scoffing at. This is church people scoffing. This is the religious people scoffing. This is people who know about the fathers and know about the promises because they say, but where is it? Where is it? I can't discuss. I cannot discuss what I don't know something about. Just think about it for a moment. And I thought for a long time that was the world stopping at the church. It's not. It's religious folk who have given up on the truth that Jesus is coming. And Peter said they, they, have, they have done it willfully. For this they are willingly even of. The fifth verse will go on down through it. Don't go there. Some say nothing concerning man's future. There are there are, are, are there is a group of churches who have no opinion on man's future. That's right. Uh, there's another church, our Roman Catholic friends, say the world will just end someday and God will do whatever he, he knows is best. They don't get into the rapture teaching or the resurrection teaching or any of those things. They 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 they, they just kind of they just kind of say one day God will bring an end to all of this and there's no hope, just fatalism. Some say man will destroy themselves. That's the humanists. But there are still others who talk about Jesus Christ returning for believers and and taking them to heaven even while the earth remains as it is. And that is the Bible believing. Believer. You don't need to talk to someone long before you begin to understand whether they believe the Bible to be the Word of God or just a good book that gives good instruction. Now, I hesitate a little bit to use this word because it's gotten a really black mark on it for, for over the last number of years. But, but technically, there it is. We are fundamentalists. We believe in the literal interpretation of the Word of God. We don't spiritualize things that we don't understand. We don't make allegory out of the promises of Jesus Christ to return. So, the word fundamentalist has been associated with terrorists and associated with, with, with groups that, 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 that do strange things. But in the realm of Christianity, we are fundamentalist Christians. We believe in the literal return of Jesus Christ. We believe in a literal heaven. We believe that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. How many know that, 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 that your mansion is probably already completed in heaven? Yeah, you understand this, that, that, that I believe Jesus is so close to returning that I get the drinks are on. <laughs> I believe the, 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 the last diamond studded uh, pavement block going to my mansion is about to be dropped into place. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That is spoken to be received literally. And then John saw the new heavens and the new earth. He saw the, the home of the bride. I'm going to get there in, in, in sometime in August month. The Lord allows me to. So we are in for the surprise of our eternal life. For there are those amongst us who think that we're just going to be in spirits 
and we're just going to be and floating around and have no purpose and have no reason just to, just to, but look, I'm going to show you from the Word of God that we're going to have physical bodies. They're going to be glorified. We're going to have relationships. We're going to have knowing. We're going to have an experience. And we're going to, it's just going to be awesome. My old superintendent, Pastor A.S. Percy from the Pentecost of the Newfoundland, he was convinced that he was going to be able to fish in the river of life. <laughs> and maybe he will. Someone said to me, do you think we'll be able to golf in heaven? I don't know. <coughs> but if I can, it's going to be way ahead of anything I've golfed here. <laughs> and I'm going to beat to the low score. I don't know. I just know it's going to be real. I just know we're going to be known as we are known. I just know these things. We're going to go down there a few moments. So that makes us fundamentalists when it comes to believing the Word of God. I, I believe this is the inspired Word of God. I believe it is accurate in its information. I believe it's accurate in its wording. I believe it's accurate in its tradition. I believe it's accurate in its, in its record of history. I believe that it will, speak, it will be fulfilled. Every jot and tittle of the law and every prophecy that was prophet will be fulfilled. In fact, many and most of them have. And the next great prophecy to be fulfilled is the rapture of the church. I'm going to get a little bit into some things in the next few Sundays as I preach when I get down to, to uh, the, the, the tribulation period and all that sort of thing. But the next great thing on the counter of God is the rapture of the... I believe the Word of God. Amen. I believe the Word of God. But there are many today who doesn't who call themselves Christians. Is Jesus coming again? And will believers be caught away to heaven? Do, do we really believe? Do we really believe? I want you to get a picture of this. You're standing in line one day. You're at the grocery store. You're, you're stopped at the red light. You're, 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 you're driving down the 401. Do we really believe that one, time, one day in the twinkling of an eye and a moment we're going to vanish? Yes. Because I want you to get this understanding. Some are going to be in their bed and they're going to be raptured from their bed. Some are going to be at, the, at, at, at work. They're going to be raptured from work. Some are going to be driving. They're going to be raptured from... Some are going to be flying airplanes and they're going to be raptured. <laughs> Do you know that there's one airline? I don't know which one. That one of the big airlines in the States. I've been told. Believe that someone in the organization believe that the rapture is the truth. And you know what they've done? They have put a pilot and a co-pilot together. One is a born again believer, and the other one does not believe it. <laughs> they, the, 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 the company, the airline, believes it so strongly that they say, we don't want this plane crashing if the rapture takes place and Captain So-and-so goes. And the co-pilot pilot by him when the slip over the seats. <laughs> See, when you really believe that the rapture is going to happen, it affects the way you live. It affects your view of the future. It affects your anticipation of what might be. And I believe it's only proper for us to say, this will I do if the Lord wills. In fact, James had a little controversy with those who, who said, today, tomorrow, we'll go and do it. He said, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, I will do this or do that. Is he really coming? Do we really believe it? Will believers be caught away? Some, some take this approach. If this is just the hope of a few fanatics, even though they mean well, then let them alone with their fantasies and dreams. They probably need something to lean on just to get through life. Leave them alone. They're not doing any harm anyway. And there are people who probably look at us and say, harmless. Leave them alone. Let them meet their little churches and talk about this rapture. They're looking for a little bit of escapism anyway, so. They don't want to face the future. 
But here's the truth. What if this idea of Jesus coming again and believers being cut away together is somehow taught in the Bible? Some of you here this morning, maybe you're not sure about this rapture thing. I suspect there are those here this morning. Not quite sure about this rapture thing. Or if it is the truth, it's so far down the road, it's, it's into another generation, it's into another sphere of existence that it doesn't affect us for the next number of hundreds of years. But what does the Bible say about this? Well, you may say, my church doesn't teach that stuff. Or my pastor doesn't preach that stuff. But I asked this question this morning. What is most important? What the church teaches, what the minister preaches, or what the Bible says? I, I just feel an urgency in my spirit to call us as a people and as a church and as a fellowship back to the Word of God. The truth is that the Word of God is, 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 is just kept visible but kind of to the side as we explore all the new theories and all the new things and all the new ways and all the humanistic approaches to doing church. Well, you know, if I preach the rapture and there's new folk in my congregation who've never heard of it, they're going to think I'm fanatical. But my responsibility is to point out to you from the Word of God that this is the truth. And the only reason why it's fanatical to you is because somebody has not preached it to you. Somebody have not shared it with you. Somebody have not opened the truth of God's Word. Let's examine the Scriptures. Did Jesus say anything about coming back again when He was here the first time? We all know that He came the first time. We weren't around. We don't know anybody that was here at the time. We haven't got any videotapes of Him. We don't have any audio tapes of His voice. We don't have any... He wasn't on our webcam. He wasn't on our... On the blog. He didn't have a blog. He, he didn't have a website. He, he didn't Twitter. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has made real to us the truth of God's Word. And so, as fundamental believers, we believe the Bible. And besides that, history records in numerous volumes by different authors that Jesus Christ lived and was crucified. And those of you. So the evidence is around us. The Bible records His birth, His parents, his family, his hometown, all the good deeds that he did, and it even tells us how he died and rose again. Therefore, we believe it because the Bible says it. We believe it because the Bible says it. Well, does the same Bible quote Jesus on the subject of coming again? Let's look at it and see. I want to establish this truth that Jesus is coming again. In Matthew 16 and 27, Jesus said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. Matthew 16 and 27. Jesus said of Himself, I will come again. In Luke 12 and 40, He says, Be ye therefore also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. Jesus is coming again. I'd like to be connected to the whole world this morning and declaring in every language of this world, Jesus is coming again. I wish I had the ability this morning to, to suspend the world for one moment and speak the language of every language on earth and say, Jesus is coming. And when they would ask me, how do you know? I would say, because the Word of God declares it to be so. And the Word of God is settled and eternal. And every living creature and those who have died will stand one day and be judged according to the righteous standard of God's Word, which is the uh, re revelation of His person and revelation of who He is. Mark 8 and 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me, Jesus said, and my words 
in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus talked to you and I. And he said, if we're ashamed of him here, he'll be ashamed of us there. Are we ashamed of Jesus? When we hear his name being pulverized and, 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 and brutalized and, and used in such vulgar ways, is it not right for us to say that Jesus is my Lord and Savior? Don't laugh when you hear people swear the name of Jesus. It's not a laughing matter. He is holy. And we say that He's our Savior. And He bears the stripes of our salvation. And He's done more for us than anyone could ever do. And He's coming again. So therefore we will not participate in the vulgar treatment of the name of Jesus that the world loves to engage in. In John chapter 14, if you will turn with me please, it is, it is the classic example of course of the words of Jesus in the 14th chapter of John and uh, about his, his coming back. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. This of course, he said, I go to prepare a place. He didn't say, I'm planning to do this, or I'm planning to do something else. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Not I might, not I might send somebody. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I will receive you. This week, we received the Queen <laughs> in Canada. Cost us a fortune. <laughs> but we graciously, as our sovereign head of state, received her. She came to us. So Jesus, I will receive you. It means he is in heaven. We're going to go to him. He's going to receive us. It is so clear here. Jesus delineated it. He said, I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus is the groom. The church is the bride. And I'll tell you something, folks. The groom longs for the bride. And the bride longs for the groom. And the moment of their coming together, the moment of their wedding day, and the moment of their presentation, and the moment of their intimacy is something that is in, in looked forward to by every bride and groom. And so you can feel the yearning heart of the groom. Because I will receive you. That where I am, there you may be also. Mm. God never intended for a bride and groom to live apart. And that's the reason why when circumstances sometimes dictate that they must, it's so wonderful when they can come back together and embrace and share each other's presence. Amen. And so it is. Jesus is longing for the bride. Amen. In fact, maybe somewhere along the way, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to a Jewish wedding. I have, I have a Jewish wedding here in my notes. Don't even have time to think about it this morning. And, and, and there, is that, there is that moment in the Jewish wedding when the, when the Jewish boy presents his bride to the father. And it's called the presentation. There is coming a day when Jesus is going to present the church to the father. It's called the presentation. Amen. And all of the angels and all of other groups that are not part of the church but they're in heaven like the Old Testament saints and, 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 and all of these wonderful things that we can't fully explain. They're going to stand in awe and see this unique relationship that exists between the church and Jesus Christ. We, we mean the groom and the bride. Amen. And he's going to present. He's going to present. We don't have a presentation moment in our wedding ceremonies but because we don't allow for it because of the structure. If I had time this morning, I would tell you how the groom would, 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 would select the bride and then he would go away 
And then he would come back after a year and he would take the bride and he would take the bride to his father's house and there he would present his bride to his father. That's what Jesus is going to do with the church. We're away. We don't belong here. We're, we're out of our context. We're, we're, we're foreigners. So when the world treats you badly, when the world treats you differently, when the world is mean towards you, you can smile at that kind of treatment because you're not home anyways. We are in foreign territory. We are not citizens. When I was in China, I tell you, I didn't feel very much at home. Particularly after I got arrested. <laughs> When, when, when I'm traveling any foreign nation, I will receive kindly in most of them. But there's something about having that Canadian passport. And there's something about the pilot saying, uh, in about 30 minutes we'll touch down in Toronto. There's something that's tipping out, and this is Canada. If you do a lot of foreign travel, you will discover that getting off the plane in any foreign country where you're not used to being there, you've got, you've got papers in your pocket, you've got, you hope everything is in order, you hope what happens if, the, if my, my, my luggage doesn't arrive, what happens if I get a cranky uh, customs officer and they begin to question my documentation. There's all of this kind of what if, what if, what if. But when you're flying over a trouble the good, you're coming into Pearson Airport. You got your Canadian passport. You know there's not going to be any weird questions asked. How have you done something weird? <laughs> it's the whole idea of passport. It's the whole idea of citizenship. Folk, we're not home yet. Keep your eyes on the Savior. Just a little a few more days to labor and we'll sit down beside the table forever yes sit down by the river how i long to be with jesus and our loved ones gathered yonder keep your eyes don't get your roots down here don't get settled down here plan for eternity with jesus not eternity down here Jesus said, I'm going to go away. I'm coming again. And where I go, you know, and the way you know, that, I, that you might be with me. He said he was going away. His purpose was to prepare a place for his followers. He would come again. He would take believers to the new home. Him and the believers would be together. In fact, it's interesting, isn't it? The history of the church, you and I at our beginning as a church, grounded in the promise of the return of Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 in particular. As the Jesus was, was shared with them on the Mount of Olives, he began to lift up. The Bible says a cloud received him. And then the, an angel came and said, The same Jesus, whom you have seen taken up, will so come again in like manner as he was taken away. We were birthed on the promise of the coming of Jesus. Amen. Let me say it again. We were birthed on the promise of the coming of Jesus. Jesus was leaving the, the, the embryonic church, the, 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 the minuscule little church that was gathered on the Mount of Olives that day. And already his heart was aching with loneliness for them. And so he sent an angel and said, Tell them, I'm coming back again. Amen. I'm coming back again. I'm coming back again. Is he coming? He's more anxious to come back than we are for him to come back. He is so fixed in hell on the bride, ready to step out at the command of the Father, that he is ready. He's coming. Church, he's coming. There's some things that got to happen, but he's coming. i got to hurry on through. Paul believed, as the other apostles, that Jesus would come again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. For he is coming. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. 
He's coming. Amen. He's coming. They preached it. They believed it. They left it on record for us. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul talked about the coming of Jesus. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who, who, who did not believe who Jesus was until after the resurrection. Jesus' family, apart from his mother, did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God until after the resurrection. During the crucifixion time. And then they show up to believers, James and Jude. James chapter 5 verse 8 talks about the coming of the Lord. John, the beloved disciple, 1 John 2 and 28, 1 John 3 and 2, talked about the coming of the Lord and how we are to live pure in readiness for the coming of the Lord. Jude, the other half, our brother of Jesus in verse 14 of Jude, there's only one chapter there right before the book of Revelation, talks about the coming of the Lord. Peter, in 1 Peter 5 and 4, talks about the coming of the Lord. Jesus talked about it. His disciples talked about it. We have seen Jesus' record while here on earth and at His ascension. Has anything changed since He returned to heaven? Well, to answer this question, we must look at the book of Revelation. Come with me to Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is back in, in, in heaven now. Third chapter of, of Revelation. I'm establishing the fact that Jesus is coming, and, is, and the Bible says so, and Jesus said so, and the disciples said so. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus is talking to the seven churches. It's the church of Philadelphia. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast with your hands, that no man take thy crown. The word quickly means suddenly. Doesn't mean he was coming quickly from that moment there in about 100 AD, 110 AD, whatever it was. The word quickly means I'm coming suddenly. Folk, Jesus is coming suddenly. We are to hold fast what we have. We're not to walk silly or stupid or like, like the five foolish virgins and have our crown taken from us. Again, in 22 and 20, you'll notice that the, the, the 22nd chapter is the last chapter in the Bible. The 22nd chapter in verse 20, this is what it says. And he who testified these things, who is Jesus Christ, of course, as we learn from the book of Revelation, says, surely I come quickly. And John responds, even so come Lord Jesus. I received some incredible insights into the into the book of John. I, I had the privilege last year to visit the Isle of Patmos, and it's about a four and a half hour boat ride from Ephesus. And, and uh, during that boat ride, I, I read a marvelous book, uh, on, on, and it was a it was a recapping of the book of John. It gave us incredible insights into the person of John. John was the beloved disciple. Did Jesus have favorites? Yes, he did. I know that's going to mess up some of your theology. He had favorites. But he's also a man, he was also a man of perfect judgment, so we, we, won't, we won't question him. But John was the one that leaned on Jesus' breast. John was the guy that always sat next to Jesus. So, so Pastor Russell was Jesus. <laughs> and John was always the one that sat closest to him. And when they broke bread together, it was John. And, 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 and there was such a special relationship with John and Jesus that, that at the cross, the disciples were there. Not there. They didn't all flee away. And Jesus hung from the cross. And he looked at John and said, John, behold your mother. Referring to his mother. And he looked at his mother and said, Mom, there's your new home. We had the privilege to visit uh, the tomb of Luke and not far from the tomb of Luke the supposed tomb of, of Jesus' mother Mary and, and the story is that John settled down in, in uh, 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 it's near Ephesus and the name of it is a, a kind of a yeah it's, 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 it's a Greek name and uh, John settled down there and it was not unusual to find the tomb of Jesus' mother in the home where John settled down, or in the town where John settled down. John was special. John was special. 
And so, guess who received the revelation of the future? John. John. At the age of 96 on the Isle of Patmos. I'll never forget, I'll never forget sitting, I'll never forget standing in the tomb, the cave where John received the revelation. This very well known. The road we used for the East Coast, the Isle of Patmos is just like the one. Rocky, barren. The only thing I didn't see was lobster traps. <laughs> and I'm sure they had something there. Maybe some kind of fishing gear there. But it was, it was, it was, it was so far removed from civilization that, that, that civilization after civilization had not built on it, so it's still very original. We had the privilege to go down into the cave. And it's believed through a John received revelation. Such a powerful moment. And that revelation was all about the coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, the first chapter sets the stage for what John saw. By the time when I would read it, a time has slipped away. But I encourage you to read it. Jesus is coming. It is a fact of the Bible. The question is, who is he coming for? Who is he coming for? He's coming for the bride. Who makes up the bride? I'm going to quickly go through here and then I'll conclude. It is coming for the bride. It is the groom coming for the bride. Who makes up the bride? Mark 8 and 38 said that those who are not ashamed of his coming. It would be, it would be somewhat awkward, wouldn't it, for me to take a beautiful bride and come to get her and she's running away from me. Or She's so taken up with all the things around her that she says, oh yeah, I, I thought you might come, so look, I'm, bit, I'm a bit busy today. Can you just hold up at the other hand and, and, and come back tomorrow? In other words, she wasn't looking for him. The bride is looking for the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus will not surprise the bride. That's a powerful statement. If I had time to enlarge it this morning, I would, but I don't. The bride will not be surprised by the coming of Jesus because the bride is looking for the coming of Jesus. The lukewarm will be surprised and they will miss his coming. The foolish will be surprised and they will miss his coming, but the bride will not. They will not be ashamed when he comes. They will know who he is. They are those that have confessed him as Lord and Savior, but most particularly Lord. See, we have a large part of the professing church today that claim him as Savior, but not, do not allow him to be Lord of their lives. But those who claim him as Savior and Lord are looking for him, and that's who he's coming for. Hebrews 9 and 28, and I don't have time to read all of this, but it says those that look for him, those that expect his return, that's who he's coming for. Those that look unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto his salvation. Unto them that look for him. It would be rather embarrassing, wouldn't it, if you were going to visit a very special friend and, and uh, you had called and said, I'm coming. Uh, could be like, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be Wednesday or Thursday. So it's Thursday, Michelle. And you're looking for so much forward to being with this friend. And you get to your friend's house and you find there's nobody home. Which I'm sure I didn't, I'm sure I got, I'm sure I got the message through. I'm sure, that, I'm sure, I'm sure. So you hang around for a while and your friend pulls in the driveway a couple hours afterwards. And he's sitting there. And he looks at you and you look at him. And he says, oh, I forgot all about you coming. <laughs> All the anticipation, all the joy drains out, doesn't it? The bride will not be surprised at the return of Christ because she's looking for him. She will not be ashamed. On the thing that look for him. 
Luke 12 and 40. Those that are ready are prepared for His coming are those that, are, that He's coming for. And there's so many other verses. Looking for that blessed hope. I think it's Titus 2 and 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking, anticipating, expecting. It could be today. Maybe it's the how. Maybe it's going to be this year. Maybe it... But you're looking. 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 Are you looking this morning for the coming of the Lord? I want you to, I, I pray and I ask the Lord to give me the right word to say at this moment. I'm simply asking you to look within your heart and say, am I looking for the coming of the Lord? Am I expecting the return of Jesus? How can we be ready for this coming? Three very simple steps. We're not musicians to come back. There's an old hymn in our book I want to sing this morning. He's coming soon. It's number 141 of the old hymn book. You won't need it because we're both glad on the PowerPoint. How can we be ready for this coming? I know I'm speaking to a, what I would call a traditional Pentecostal congregation. But I just know in my spirit when there's folk here that need to hear this. We all need to hear it. We all need in our busy days, in our demands of life, in the in the home drum and the and the and all of the hoop wall that makes up life today and business, we can, can lose the focus on the main thing. And the main thing is that we are Christians and we have a hope and that Jesus is coming. Sometimes we can lose focus of that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. It says we must accept Jesus, Lord and Savior, if we are to be ready for His coming. In 1 John chapter 3 and 3, we must be pure and holy by the power and grace of God. He that hath that hope in Him purifies Himself, even as Christ is pure. For the holy walk is, is the walk of a man or a woman or a boy or a girl or a teenager who, who believes that Jesus is coming and lives in readiness for that coming. Hebrews 12 and 14, Thessalonians 5 and 23 talks about being blameless by the grace of God, walking above the sin of the world by the grace of God, living pure and separate from the world by the grace of God. In 1 John 2 and 28 says that Jesus must be the center of our lives. In other words, we must abide in Him. And He abides in us. Is Jesus the center of our lives? That's a probing question. I ask it with all sincerity and all seriousness this morning. Is Jesus the center of our lives? Some say, oh yeah, pastor, you're the pastor. You better have Jesus in the center of your life. That's how you exist. That's how you that's, that's your calling. He's not the center of my life because I'm a pastor. He was the center of my life long before God called me. The full time ministry. Is he the center? Is he the center of our lives? That's a probing question. Is Christ the thing in our lives? Is he the main thing in our lives? Oh, we have priorities in our lives. We have large things we need to contend with, large things we need to do, and large things we need to accomplish. But, but, but is he the center? I asked this audience this morning, this great audience, is he the center? Are we looking for the coming of the Lord? Am I not talking about being fanatical? I'm not talking about selling your car, spending all your money, because Jesus is coming. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living right in this upside down world. I'm talking about having a hope that's not based on the G20 meetings, that's not based on an economic recovery. That's not based on the housing market going skyrocket. If that happens, wonderful. If it doesn't happen, our hope hasn't changed. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. My hope is not any of those things. My hope is one day, either by the resurrection or the rapture, I am going to be caught away to be with Jesus. And until that time comes, I am going to live for Him. I am going to let my understanding of Scripture and the voice of the Spirit guide me in, in, in the things I do and how I live. I'm not going to let the voice of the world distract me from the Word of God or how I ought to live as a believer. I'm not going to let saint other, other believers dictate how I'm going to live. I'm going to live by the Word of God. My yes. pastor, they're saved. And look what they're doing. So why can't I do it? You want to do it? Go do it. <laughs> Well, they seem to be sold into the world and they seem to be okay. Not according to the word of God. He calls us to be separate. He calls us to be pure. He calls us to be holy. And then He gives us the Holy Spirit to enable us to be that. That's the neat thing about this. He didn't say, live holy. I didn't say, good luck. He said, live holy. And then He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to guide us and to lead us. And then He gave us the Word. Yeah. Teach us how to live. Yeah. So if we put that to one side, and we think the Holy Spirit is more an embarrassment than a, than a help, we're in trouble. Yeah. Am I ready for the coming of the Will I be surprised in Jesus Christ? Will I be shocked? Will you be surprised? Will you be shocked when Jesus comes? That's the question. That I'll leave you to that. Why? Because I want every individual in this building to be looking for the coming of the Lord. I want every individual in this building to go home and sit down with your families and talk about the coming of Jesus. I want your little children and your teenagers to hear you talking about the coming of Jesus to the point where they begin to get curious and interested and want to know more. And yes, become scared until they know Jesus. The knowledge of the truth has scared people into the kingdom. Because that's the kind of power that was on for their lives. I suppose I could say here today, and not literally does would raise their hands, that, that was there ever a time as a young person, you knew about becoming a Lord, you weren't saved. And all of a sudden, mom didn't answer when you called her. You called her. First thing came to your mind, Jesus is coming. Let me just do a quick survey. How many had that experience? I got both hands up because I've had that experience as an unsaved person. More of you have had the same experience. That's the kind of awareness. But today, that's not happening, folks, because families are taking the coming of the Lord lightly. I'm going to ask you this morning. We're going to stand and stand with this. Put that number on the board, please. In these the closing days of life. This morning, I would ask you, be sure you're ready. Be sure you're ready. Be sure you're ready. Pastor, I've been preaching for years. I didn't say you were I saw you ready. Are you watching? Are you looking? Is there a longing in your heart for the coming of the Lord? Pastor, I'm, I'm not going to get fanatical. It's not making you be fanatical. Are you, are you walking, expecting the coming of Jesus?